This is our Economic State of the Union commentary on economic and geopolitical issues set to be broadcast October 8, 2014 by Will of the People Constitutional Authority Board, a national local governing body in the United States. The promise of a guiding light in a city on a hill coming down from the heavens to be in the presence of the people was somehow replaced with the notion of somebody's palace with a guarded lookout tower by a tyrannical kingdom far from Zion. The American people have been meticulously duped into being subjected to economic oppression and rule by heartless corporate exploitation, all under the guise of a free market. But a free market isn't truly free unless its people are free. The government has mortgaged our future and our children's future for the misguided wanderlust of arrogant corporate entitlement. We aren't struggling to get out of a recession because the working poor and ordinary people have too much. We have a lingering recession because corporate executives and banks have too much. Those who would say freedom is being delayed. The government's natural role is to balance the interests of the people, corporations, and even at times religion. But in participating for corporate leverage against constitutional protections, higher laws that would otherwise protect against the specific detriment of the people, and backlash upon religion, the government institutionalized the problem. The Constitution was itself in jeopardy due to this conundrum of governance, where the federal government acted to destroy parts of the Constitution. This cannot be. The United States government is a defiled sacred trust, full of broken promises and abandoned rights, a forgotten duty to honor the Constitution and defend the people. The federal government was not authorized of the Constitution to change the Bill of Rights without just representation and ratification, nor were they authorized to refuse petitions of the people by the 2012 Continental Congress that disputed federal authority to do so. The Tenth Amendment says, when powers are not delegated to the federal government, they are reserved to the people. The people exercise their enforcement powers through federal recall using local government answerable to the people, which is in their purview. But bureaucracy, the courts, and state elections officials tried to block it. What you did was wrong, and you know it. People have initiated a federal recall according to applicable law and done it with all of you laughing in their faces. So the people held to consent of the governed and pressed for their removal. And as has been said in Ferguson, You've lost your authority to govern this country, and you're just going to have to step aside peacefully if this country is going to heal. That's the way it is. If our nation's leaders do not have the willpower to keep their hands out of the cookie jar and are no longer capable of being responsible to the people, then they are the ones who need governing. People protested, assembled, petitioned, and notified its nation's leaders of unauthorized activity. After being refused and ignored, the people sought relief in the courts, asserted their rightful powers, filed a people-initiated recall, held national leaders in contempt, and ordered warrants for relinquishment of their office. There can be no doubt the government fell. It doesn't matter if states notified the public of the voting. Those recalled lost their right to serve this country. They stomped on their oath of office and spit the people in the face while thumbing their nose at the Constitution. They tainted the single greatest honor a citizen could have, serving the nation. That's what democracy is all about. All of you forgot that. When you have privilege your whole life, you feel like you're entitled to it. Power can be a wonderful tool, if used wisely for the interests of the nation. But if you are not honorable without it, it will never satisfy you. The Founding Fathers said this form of government is wholly unacceptable for an amoral people and recognized powers of the people were necessary to keep it in check. It is unconscionable that America's public servants had anything but corrupt intentions in acting as they have against higher law. There should not be the slightest doubt they are without honor and integrity, stand condemned by their own acts in the eyes of the world. Of all the forms of tyranny, there is none more offensive and least desirable than a small group desiring to have more control of the political economic system for personal gain. 
In this day and age, it is remarkable there are still those who have a sense of nostalgia for the ultimate control that corporations had when there were corporate trusts. Stronghold of the mighty overlords of industry, utility, and banking have increased their worth and control at the expense of ordinary persons and the environment. While methods to pull back on the reins of their damaging activities and checks that would regulate such illicit affairs have all eroded to the point of impudence. Even the political parties are part of the control mechanism in Washington. Legislation is written with polarizing views so that members of those parties serving in office happen to deny any comments by members of a party that may expose their collusion. Republicans blame the Democrats and the left say it's the right and the right says it's the left so that no one can say for sure who's right and who's wrong. Mailers are sent out to get their minions worked up into a door-knocking frenzy to stand on the side of an issue that will never gain bipartisan support whose real purpose is to squelch the voice of real protesters trying to use the issue to protect liberty. In the meantime, depending on what side of the legislation a particular party may be on, one party is complacent and the other is complicit. Under this purely evil scheme, there are no laws for the people, only what benefit corporate executives and the elite. We've all been lied to. Some may wonder how this could happen in America first clue was teaching people to hate. In this nation, the naysayers and fearmongers have broadcast their disgust for persons of color, persuasion, religion, and certain party affiliation. This is not mudslinging or political banter. It is a hate crime, pure and simple. We've become so accustomed to it, we forget that a victim oftentimes can be an aggressor when they lash out unnecessarily at their supposed tormentor. But the people are smart enough to see through the ruse. Enforcement authority of reserved federal powers of the people permit a people-initiated federal recall election when government is no longer accountable to the people. Some say a federal recall election does not exist because the Constitution does not explicitly mention how the people may enforce accountability for consent of the governed. The people needed to exist in order to defend the Constitution's protection of their rights. The Bill of Rights were in jeopardy, and without the recall, the people were left to revolt according to the Declaration of Independence. The government had already stepped up its game plan to provide local police with enough bullets for every person and military-grade weapons, as Ferguson, Missouri, is aware. But the people resisted the inclination to riot in order to exercise their powers to protest their rights under higher law, and so they did. Instead of replacing the government with new by revolt, people challenged the existing political system. Instead of rebelling against the Constitution, people stood firm on the promises of extraordinary favor offered in its higher law. The power is in the hands of the powerless, and people have handed that power to me. They would just as soon as take that power away if they believed I was doing any of this for myself. But I'm not that way. Trust is earned time and again. People have placed their trust in me to provide restitution for middle-class income loss, and to build up the economy, their economy. If you corporate executives and bankers hadn't been so greedy and instead shared gains and power from derivatives and other schemes, the people wouldn't have asserted themselves and taken it back. Why you did it to the people it must be acceptable to do the same thing back to you or such laws would be unlawful, right? Of course, King Kisharshu wrote a law saying that not only may the people defend themselves against tyranny, but the Hamans of the world must suffer the conviction of their own laws. So you must pay what you dish out. That's fair. The Anglo-Saxon culture was founded on this. The Magna Carta was founded on this. The Declaration of Independence and Constitution were founded on this. And I'm affirming this by constitutional order. I thought we'd learned that. Some may be complaining I have no right to what they say is sitting in their pocketbooks of corporate managers and bankers. I'm not trying to steal from corporations and the wealthy. It is you who have stolen from the American people time and again, cooking up schemes to steal the people's homes from the poorest of the poor, and then stealing from taxpayers to pay for your retirement when your planned mismanagement of sunk derivatives, embezzling this mandatory crowdfunding called income tax, causes the country to go belly up. So go ahead and think it's yours, because the people know better. 
people know the recession is still going on, not just in places, but all over the country. Friends and people I've met cannot afford their own place, are living with their folks and in motels as grown adults with children of their own. I've heard of those who have considered homelessness as an option, and how there are so many that have dropped off receiving unemployment that cannot find work yet, that applications for social programs have skyrocketed 485%, because things are still really that bad. And our nation's leaders are so removed from the ordinary person, the government doesn't hear these struggles. The struggle for freedom and democracy, therefore, is not limited to nations that do not have it. For people of the United States have had to wrestle with the government from time to time for a course change, so as to make liberty for every person its resolute and concerted pursuit. That collaboration between the economic puppeteers, war profiteers, and the political institutions that are supposed to govern them are the weakest link to secure and stabilize the global order of geopolitical states and social political economies. If poised to splinter the people from their rights, under such there can be no world order, seeing the people have had a taste of freedom and can no longer go back, despite what Nixon's foreign advisor might say. This one thing, separating people from their rights, will bring down any governing organization, deeming it illegitimate, and bring that region into uncertainty. However, governments that embrace economic individuality, encourage participatory governance, engage global stewardship, and enact cooperative enterprise will raise the social, political, and economic standing of everyone in their sphere of influence, but quite simultaneously ensure their own success. Without freedom, successive wave after wave of pendulum swings between polarizing ideologies and clashes of class-generated animosity will fester until the children finally expel their parents and the whole system of entitlement collapses. There is no turning back. Corporate managers and shareholders that sought self-serving power are a victim of their own propaganda for self-fulfillment. The people believed it was theirs too. No one's entitled to steal from someone else. And now, after being stolen, the people want their freedom back. Freedom guaranteed in the Constitution. It is incumbent upon me, then, with all the duties bestowed on this legitimate administration, established by constitutional order, to restore balance of authority as the framers saw fit. Rather than debate the merits of reserved federal powers of the people, as the Constitution calls it, it is best to demonstrate its enforcement first and then debate its application for another century. In politics, one makes use of the tools at hand but new political tools had to be invented to spearhead this transition. It is in keeping with our treasured heritage that I have come to the highest office in the land as defender of the Constitution, holding the office until government is restored by affirming the federal recall and becoming reauthorized of the Constitution. I want to show the people of America that their nation does not belong to the evil elite or corrupt congresspersons, and that there is a constitutional duty for all government to protect and defend the rights and privileges preserved for the people by the Founding Fathers found in the pages of higher law. Having been passed the baton, the people now have an example that has shaken the highest branches of government out of their pinnacle of degeneracy. Like a regent protector might do, I am to intercede for the people to bring restitution for grievances and restore balance to laws that contravene. The intercession on behalf of the American people for restitution of grievances is my fundamental job. That is my purpose, sworn in an, as an intercessor to serve on the great court and council of the people, and so entrusted with the mantle of such great call and election over the presidency, vested with the authority of all three branches. There's no longer any debate. The people have chosen what matters most to them is them. It's not merely about the economy, it's about freedom. The key is how to unlock the policies that got us into this recession and conundrum of governance in the first place, and return to that which has made America great, to show you what it would be like when this government of the people becomes more than symbolic and affects change beyond the mere legal standing it holds. What we need right now is model government, cooperative market enterprise, fair taxes and equitable laws. 
common sense approach to modern global economics that protests of the people have fought to ensure then suggests our government can and should operate within its means while managers nurture individualistic purpose as workers foster collaborative productivity. Responsible government is not a question of its size or the types of entitlements it doles out. All that surplus goes somewhere. Rather, the government must balance its assistance between seniors and the poor, veterans and health care, military campaigns and peace missions, religion composed and the arts congenial, corporate interests and small business gain, and balancing desires of the privileged with the needs of the people. With that, this economic plan revisits portions of Ronald Reagan's tax reform that worked, reduce frivolous spending, streamline corporate and banking regulation, more evenly distribute proportionate taxation, and a precision monetary policy without the need for drastic changes to revenue and tax expenditures. Save smarter, earn higher, achieve more. This tax adjustment in this comprehensive plan will modify ordinary income rates to reflect wage stagflation, increase small business buying power and venture partnership, banish loopholes for eluding corporate irresponsibility in stashing executive retirement, discipline strategies and reward mechanisms to benefit the health and productivity of the worker, and other fair share minimums while investing in non-fossil fuel and energy and technology infrastructure that increases productivity and availability of medium to high income jobs and clear steps to middle class wealth. For the people are in need of relief from economic oppression and war on the working and middle classes, just as it was true in Teddy Roosevelt's time. A double portion, as it is understood in law, is coming upon this generation as restitution for crimes against the people as set forth in the Constitution and precedent in higher law. The courts have said that Teddy Roosevelt had the authority to protect the nation's citizenry from harm when breaking up the corporate trusts like oil, utilities, and banks in order to bring balance. Here we are a hundred years later, still threatened by poor health conditions, chemicals polluting the environment, corrupt governmental practices, and stifled worker ambition. I'm not convinced that more antitrust laws would bring more balance. We need to break up the schemes, not the businesses. As a first step, with the authority granted by the courts, we must pull back the reins as follows. Rigging of LIBOR and derivatives by banks is prohibited. As this government will set the conditions, any changes must be authorized and conform to equitable law without causing grievance, and recent minimum wage increase will be reduced and temporarily held to recession levels to give growth some breathing room. Economists know that minimum wage regulates inflation and does little to increase one's earning power. Earning power instead comes from productivity. Rather than what is needed is far-reaching policy reform just by making minor adjustments in the tax code to increase productivity. This approach abandons the myth that only big corporations could ever be productive or create jobs. We know that's not true. The tax code will receive an overhaul in this manner. Tax filers will have the permanent option of a flat tax rate of 20% less the flat tax rate for the state. Income tax on cancellation of home mortgage debt as a gain, an annual gift tax will be permanently excluded for incomes less than 235000 a year. Other estate gift and GST taxes up to 112000 will be permanently excluded for benefactors and recipients earning less than 112000 a year. Tax on unemployment insurance is made permanently excludable from income and the upper limit for Social Security withholding is permanently eliminated. Internet purchases across state lines will be taxed at the federal level, equal to any known state sales tax less cost of shipping. Portions of charity that goes toward reducing dependence on government will be subtracted from taxes owed. Terrorist and malevolent controlling organizations shall be restricted from charitable status. Otherwise, charitable deduction is also made permanent. And, contacting delinquent debtors via cell phones without harassment or predatory techniques is authorized. 
This reform includes a modest tax refund for incomes less than 112000 while making a fair tax affordable for lower income levels through a staggered rate for all. It adjusts presidential pay by $75,094 to improve proportionate governmental worker pay and benefits, as well as provides keys to increase recycling to 95%, excluding rocks and ash, while providing tax breaks to those who need it the most. This is what I call the tax party. Mandatory program and discretionary fund changes will also take place to reduce dependence on foreign oil as follows. Repurpose the RNE tax credit, renewable electricity production, and reduce excise tax intended for liquid natural gas available for fossil fuel free near zero discharge research and energy as phased investments. Reallocate fossil fuel based so called renewable alternative and advanced energy loopholes, credits, and subsidies to clean coal scrubbers cellulose, wood-like pellets, and nuclear fusion tech. Establish environmental impact, monitoring, and cleanup fees for new methods, including hydraulic fracturing, also known as fracking. Repurpose biofuel and advanced technology production tax credits for non-fossil fuel startup or small business cellulose at biofuel equipment purchase, investment, and vehicle manufacturing loans. Reallocate energy efficient and water conservation tax credits for new home and business construction, underground drip sprinklers and waterless urinals as mandatory subsidies. Reallocate issuable bonds as government backed loans for productivity uses with the lowest interest and longest term first offered to small business. Enact toxic spill and loss liability expense as a mandatory trust fund for cleanup or reward as bonus when met annual objective goes unused. Eligible uses for such will include ecologically sustainable structures, catastrophic weather resistant buildings, and small business desalinized water supply projects, and companies that achieve 95% recycling of waste and scrap and less than 3% discharge of total pollutants will pay a maximum of 10% corporate tax, whereas all others will pay a flat tax of 35%, excluded from loopholes and subsidies. More provisions of law will be implemented to bring balance to corporate schemes, and anyone who can afford to pay their fair share will contribute what they must. As a finance executive for many years, I have created and maintained many corporate budgets and with cost information made available to me, it was determined the federal government can generate a surplus of as much as $285 billion for investment in jump-starting sustainable economic growth over the next five years. The question is, what industry should we invest in? Our horseless carriages and flying hollow tubes may have breastplates of iron to transport people in their bellies safely, but they breathe fire like dragons and fill the sky with their toxic plague, requiring the purchase of more and more of the black tar that cools and lubricates the earth, from self-appointed rulers in caves that wish to do us harm, while its plume spills, killing a third of the life in the Gulf Sea. I don't like it. Too much work to try to fix. Why not just change the source of the fuel problem, then? We tried something else, called corn ethanol, because that is what grows well here and was something big agriculture could get its hands on to control. But in order to be profitable, distillers had to mix the leftover pulp in with the cattle feed supply. Before most knew it, we had economic chaos. Newsweek in May 2007 reported famine in Africa as it cost a day's wage for a loaf of bread. A man in Tunisia left himself on fire because he couldn't afford to buy groceries to sell, setting off what has become known as the Arab Spring. As soy farming became profitable, more plant estrogens were introduced into the food supply, causing a disruption in male hormonal balance. Meanwhile, oil companies start buying up corn distilleries to corner the market away from biofuels. Then oil and gas companies found a new way to get energy from the ground by fracking. Earthquakes started happening in diverse places as toxic chemicals found their way into drinking water supply and temperatures rose globally. You've had your chance to find sustainable energy supply and you failed. Why, well, you only wanted to control to take advantage of the people. 
You had no intention of sustaining the people's economy. You lied to get the work. So oil, gas, mining, and energy will take a back seat for a while, as wholesale fuel and energy prices will be suspended at 2012 rates until biofuels come online. The hallmark of this reform is the concerted effort to reduce tailpipe emissions, dependence on foreign oil, and return to a manageable CO2 level of 350 parts per million. The people need to know we have such plans. We're going to build energy plants in places where there are old waste dumps, repair breaches in the nation's bridges, restore roads to be safe to drive again, and for people to walk at night. Give me a hammer and I'll do it. Let's nail them all up. We're going to build a country of free people, free homes, free communities, and freedom, just as it was true in Lincoln's time. That's what I call a freed market enterprise. While we're at it, we also ought to overhaul one of our nation's oldest institutions. We're spending just as much on military as we are running government and entitlements combined. To update our military and get the spending under control, we need to take a look at the changes to warfare. This is supposed to be a time of peace, not war. The season we are in does not match what we are experiencing. Terrorism, as you may know, has become a serious concern. What you may not know is why. Under the threat of jihadi terrorism, all nations are at risk. It is clear there is no country immune from it. The enormous range and destructive power of these individual fighters has transformed the debate of what constitutes a battlefield. The distinction between soldiers and civilians is blurred, so it is imperative to understand their strategy of warfare. In wars of the past, there were only a few ways to attack, by land, air, or sea. Along came guerrilla warfare tactics and custom-made bombs used by terrorists, and entirely new methods of striking a target became possible. War became no longer confined to the battlefield with the reinvention of psychological attacks and propaganda fronts. America is good at building technologically superior weapons, such as bombs. But our strengths work against us, as they did in Pearl Harbor in World War II. We feel protected by distance. Confidence our bombs and security will protect us against an invasion and will shield us from any incoming threat. This is illusionary and short-sighted. Antiquated and near-sighted thinking lead us to rely on our military prowess and might while our guns misfire in the desert and whistleblowers expose the deaths brought on by the Humvee lobby. Terrorists, on the other hand, hide in crowded apartment buildings and launch rockets at our friends from schoolyards. Even when we score a hit, we lose. Currently, the banned ISIS poses the biggest threat. Harry St. John Philby, an expatriated British official, worked with Abdelaziz to oppose Ottoman rule. The result was a Saudi Arab state and a sympathetic form of the Wahhabism religion. ISIS is an attempt to return to the Puritan fundamentals of Wahhabism and exercise all other religions by force. This fight is one of ideology and cannot be won by killing. Blood feuds and extermination campaigns have never worked. History is littered with remnants that rise up with each successive generation. Much like ISIS is doing now, taking peace from the earth by genocide, Hitler exploited arbitrary political boundaries and generations of religious infighting in Yugoslavia. The so-called axis of evil is in the mind. Countries are not evil. Rulers and influential people that think of evil deeds, whether upon citizens, the economy, or the environment, are, as what the Greeks call, Apollyon. It is that kind that must charter for good will upon every person in every country or be brought back into right standing. Just as ISIS in telling its members that peace comes from blood, so bankers that steal from homeowners and corporations that pollute are the axis of evil today. Rather, blood is atoned by the pure selfless sacrifice of a willing innocent. But the stains of a helpless victim for someone else's gain, whether in this life or the hereafter, cries out. Only whenever our own national security and economy was threatened did we act against Syria, as we have with incidents in Iraq and Iran over the years. Blood speaks. Assad's regime murdered over 200,000 men, women, and children while we watched it play out on the news. 
We issued the threat of economic sanctions and hid behind a rhetoric of diplomacy and considered how it would make us look to historians. How selfish. This is not a pageant show. The presidency means much more than one man's interests. Blood is crying out for the protection of the innocent. If we didn't bother to work out the details for the best outcome till now, Shame on leaders who forget why they are in office. So we should get back to the task of keeping watch over the nations. The order of the day will be as it was with the Founding Fathers, piracy on the high seas. Policing does not mean dominance by superior imperialism or subjecting people against their will as misguided domino theory suggests. Rather, our manifest destiny is to intercede for the people by interposing higher law and will on their aggressors and sacrificing unrestrained corporate desires so the people might have the opportunity to excel and pursue their God-given purpose. And that destiny does not come at the expense of the less fortunate, but comes by way of mutual cooperation, as it is the desire of this administration to aid companies committed to equitable opportunity. I'm announcing it is now and forevermore the duty of this government to ensure the protection of civilians as best we can, whenever we can, wherever we should, just as we support defensible borders and the right of a people to autonomous rule. We will preserve freighters of precious cargo and undermine terrorist operations. We will employ an oil spot strategy to secure and hold areas cleared of terrorist activity. However, as in the guns of August, our military commanders today are making the mistake of assuming they are in tune with the strategies of the enemy, without taking into account the dynamics of how everything has changed. We refuse to learn the real lesson of Vietnam, psychological warfare, and now we're failing on the propaganda front. We must stop inviting war for the sake of war, because it's not helping. Military spending then would be better reallocated towards protection of civilians in locations under siege to acts of terror, giving much needed attention to deconstructing ideology and offering a strong guiding presence to local governments there. And profit will be taken out of war making and security as touching armaments, munitions and vehicles made for government to discourage corporate lobby from providing the wrong tools for the wrong job. Instead, we will allocate defense spending proportionate to appropriate use, tools, supply, and property to minimize casualty and death. We will halt production of spit and polish weapons and clumsy bombs in favor of desert condition mechanisms, corner pairing rifles, MRAP vehicles, and room localized pinpoint accurate micro detonation systems designed to protect civilians. We will do the same with fossil fuels, reallocating profits from governmental use and money spent on falsified and tainted marketing research propaganda. These will be entrusted on behalf of the American people as restitution for avoidable pollution and specific income damages. Now peace is not just the presence of justice, it is the absence of conflict. It is not merely the goal, it is the destination. So protection of the people cannot come at the expense of liberty. And as a nation, we have been given this test of half-heartedness, and we will pass. For to everyone who has been given a great task, they will be given abundance. Our Constitution doesn't allow holding on to electronic data without due process, and the people have protested spying on American citizens. It's not a direction the people permit, and must be dismantled. Security updates for electronic devices have never been about the people's security. One of the sons of my good friend George Mason was incarcerated because someone hacked his computer. But the judge was not merciful because a Trojan horse type virus was found. What is the government doing convicting people before they appear in court? The government must be subject to law if it is to hand it out. So we will follow the constitutional method for acquiring warrants of electronic papers and effects. Corruption has infiltrated every part of our nation's government. With that, None of our nation's past should remain hidden, but be open for the world to see the government as it truly is. As a reminder, we are not invincible or infallible. Therefore, I am announcing the Freedom of Information Act shall be forevermore extended to all government and its automatic release shortened to five years. We will periodically remove security protocols and dump all of our secrets onto the Internet in a manner that keeps honest people honest and forces the shadows to have nowhere to hide. 
holding an alleged law over the people to force everyone in the U.S. to take a course of action is an ultimatum, not a choice. So security at the expense of freedom is controlled by fear, not protection. I therefore order mercenary cells and paramilitary to stand down that were hired by the government to hasten carrying out violent acts against citizens. No, we will not enter a period of civil unrest. We will enter this period of great rest. Freedom is not negotiable. Certainly, in our wariness of constitutional conflicts, there may be danger of pitfalls. But there is a promise of great reward and favor if we act honorably and justly. We will be accountable to the people, as our forefathers intended. And as often as we hope, there is a bright, beautiful future waiting for us at the end of every day. I understand we're not currently ready for peace. But peace must come when it is its season, or generations will face perpetual fright, poverty, and divorce. Media has been vigilant in preparing the Brotherhood generation for war. They have glorified zombies and peddled divorce. Our children will not have to experience the nightmare of dead soldiers flickering in the pale of cannon fire, nor will wives have to suffer the heartache of letting go. This is a generation of peace, not a frozen World War Z. This is not the time to give up on each other, to sow the seeds of mistrust. Faulty reports by pseudo-economists supplant the idea in evil lawmakers that divorce somehow might help the economy by creating new purchases, when all it really does is force the people to suffer lower standards of living for a lot longer. Rather, let families lock arms together for this common goal. Find a way to live as one, to make it work. This administration says, please stay. But the home is fractured. Many women are not comfortable with long-term role reversal. The stress of having to bring home the money should not be her concern. She's exhausted and he's sick of sleeping on the couch. Not all women have a propensity for risk, and not many men are a good substitute for being a mom. That's nature's way of saying, this is just temporary. Now is the time for men to be more like men, rather than trying to make them something they are not. Let's get to working again through higher paying jobs so we can build a home worth living and make the world a better place for generations to come. So we will extemporize and experiment what peace is and how it is and covenant with nations for its declaration. As our military spending focuses on peace and saving lives, our nation's leaders are freed to find new means of appearing to be great in the eyes of country folk by bringing our nation's budget into balance without loss to areas of need. Once the supply side of federal revenue has been brought back into equilibrium, the monetary policy of this plan will get the federal deficit under control and start tackling the nation's liabilities owed. I say that not believing in owing money. I believe in the ability of the American people to shine as the morning sun and prosper. This is why we have answered the call to protest, to occupy against government that would oppress its people, as Queen Esther, Oliver Cromwell, and our own founding fathers have. Freedom reigns. With that, I vow to restore the fortunes of Main Street, the incomes of the people, the economically oppressed that have been held captive by pervasive poverty entrapment and persistent schemes to lower the glass ceiling. So this is the day of reckoning. We will rein in runaway corporate lobby and questionable business practice, align with equitable laws that advance reasonable corporate goals without detriment to the public, taxpayer, homeowner, and worker. It is also time to end the constant addition of unnecessary consumer costs, gouging worker protections, and having working and middle classes bear the brunt of executive privilege and tax breaks for the wealthy. This plan supports the right of an individual worker to participate in a union and strike, and restricts corporations from oppressive tactics while reserving severe punishment only for actual harm and intentional uncooperation and public employees will be provided an independent review of conditions as an alternative to strike. Reversible perpetual reverse mortgages will be offered family farmers that were hit, much in the same way homeowners were hit by the bank bailout home grab, while at the same time existing fraud and waste will be done away with by paying market equilibrium subsidized farmers to produce non-GMO humanitarian aid, and vouchers as price controls will offset high family farmer crop insurance premiums. Interest rates will be set to a maximum of 18.5% to discourage banks from excessive gouging on individual earnings into multiple lifetimes. 
and Perkins Loan Program and Student Loans shall be made to comply with 35-day payment cycle and waiver of interest and penalties for unemployment and other hardships and emergencies. The people have suffered much at the hands of corporate jackals, and so corporations are made liable for reasonable, avoidable injury and harm without the necessity of prior law, and shall reserve one-third of executive retirement pay in the employee's trust as a silver parachute for severance and mismanagement. Also, corporations will be penalized double the amount of executive pay, retirement, and options for every incident of withholding severance and cost of living increases from their employee. Also, corporations are made responsible to ensure wages and benefits by sister companies and suppliers in other countries will reflect incomes and benefits comparable to at least one-fourth their median standard of living for middle class per set economic tiers. At the same time, corporations will be given every care to meet those requirements. After supplying them online programs and assistance, penalties for failure to comply with electronic tax filing requirements will not be imposed on employers where cost of correction is prohibitive, and interest on penalties and fees shall not ever be compounded. To help pay for this governmental help desk of sorts, the telephone excise tax will be reformulated to include businesses generating over a thousand calls per week. It is also the role of this government to provide a clear path to being personally productive, not just job creation and worker protections. Here I'm introducing policy adjustments to support a realistic and comprehensive safety net. Rather than being handed down programs that are proven not to work, but will permit this government to decrease real unreported unemployment, as this quote embodies. Over the course of recent years, this nation's government has come to believe different things from the people it governs. Leaders and lawmakers think this country is fine and we should go about doing business as usual. I just don't feel that way. Because things are not fine. We've got so many problems, we don't want to look at them anymore. They blend together in a big noise and pretty soon we can't hear ourselves think. But that's not even the worst part. The worst part is we feel we can't do anything about it. And that's a tragedy. Because we can. We don't know where to start. Maybe that's what it is. But I have an idea where we can start. From today, I am going to make it the responsibility of this government to find a job for every American who wants one. Now this is a bold step which we will achieve in key areas of focus as follows. This government will remove the dilemma of first-come, first-served bed availability in so-called halfway houses by enabling the homeless to receive probationary vouchers with tax credit incentives good for food, clothes, shelter, and transportation during employment. This is a brilliant program. It's paid from the worker's own salary. Next, this government will remove the dilemma of depressed communities having to entice criminals into job training for lower paying office skills by offering gang members, bank, and corporate subsidized 18-month construction apprenticeships in three semi-related trades while removing neighborhood blight on foreclosed homes and economically receded regions. This will reduce drug-related impact while investing in communities. In addition, Credit cards have become the safety net of choice by those caught in transition in recent years. But credit cards were designed to be short-term loans. So those receiving unemployment or have not yet found work will be exempt from having their balances lowered with no interest in bank fees when used for food, work clothes, modest utilities, and vehicle maintenance for an average period of professionals seeking to re-enter the workforce plus 13 weeks. So even if one cannot find a job, they won't get kicked while they are down. Regarding health, the Affordable Care Act should have never have been leaderless, and its closed-door Senate hearings could not have been monitored by the power of the state. Universal health care has become a way to penalize the little guy during a recession, a mess that needs cleaning up now that people have rejected socialized medicine. But we can fix it, Charlotte. It's okay. Non-elective contributions to employee health insurance by small employers shall be permanently proportionately reimbursable from expense but unclaimed coverage and reverse any recent penalties. Going forward, insurance deductibles will be limited to affordable income levels. The use of generic drugs and herbal formulas by low-income beneficiaries will be encouraged. My own son is a recovering autistic who was unnecessarily given thimerosal-laced vaccination on his day of birth. 
There's no way an increase in autistic-like cases can skyrocket since 1987 during a population implosion, or for a town in the Midwest having higher number of incidents of autistic-like behaviors than the rest of the country, located downstream and downwind from neurotoxin-tainted plumes, and still call these genetic. Therefore, pharmaceuticals that aid in the destruction of the immune system and vital organs are abolished and their subsidies and tax credits go toward non-religious natural cures, remedies, and treatments. Out of economic necessity and to remove the polarization of poorer voters, this government also puts an end to subsidies for pregnancy terminations and pharmaceutical abortifacients while encouraging church and community-led adoption. Stem cell research on any fertilized egg shall be revoked in favor of storing umbilical cord blood stem cells, which will be cataloged and kept by the hospital for the family and research. We will also ban chemicals and additives that poison and harm the food supply, such as aspartame, bisphenol A, cadmium, candida, neocontinoid pesticides, nonstick coatings, MSG and thimerosal to name a few, while providing tax incentives for their alternatives as well as soy. We will preempt mega disasters for multiple state drought and fires, extreme hurricanes and tornadoes, super tsunamis and volcanoes, and massive quakes and lake flooding as we near the next climate cycle. We will supplement water supply with desalinized filtered water throughout the west, midwest, and sinkhole prone coastal areas in the southeast. This departure from aspects of the free market cannot compensate for, but should, will not create a mere illusion of economic recovery, but enable this people to experience increased opportunity and better health for their productivity. But why stop at the door when we can create real growth, as John Nash's economic model suggests? While operating at a surplus, we will expand submerged and elevated highway corridors and high traffic areas through rough terrain, such as verdulas and bay tunnels, to start. This government would also make available next-gen technology the world needs while creating higher paying jobs at home for tracking deep sea fishing weights and tsunami warning systems. We will make available staggered interest rates to encourage startup and small business spending in industry that will increase production while installing infrastructure such as P-cell, towerless phone service and interlocking solar panel roads. And all manner of crowdfunding with business plans will be made legal for any size project under every SEC rule for small business and startups, and those having no relation to fossil fuels, or those that exist in the substitute industry, harmed or excluded by corporate giants. New technologies will create eco-friendly jobs too. This government will offer family-owned farming communities in the U.S., Mexico, and Canada sustainable eco-farming techniques and desalinized water filtration methods. This government will advance fire point fusion reactors and Big E integrated biofuels and energy production plants. I will personally offer my own patented Big E environmentally sound and economically sustainable cellulosic biofuels and energy from waste to any company in the world that would adhere to my high standards and licensing rights. And in development stages is synchrotron, electromagnetic energy, and ludicrous fast computing operating system, which this government will outsource to bring online. In addition, people have suffered long and in the pits of economic despair. So it is the policy of this government, the personal debts of the people, will be erased with a stone. This is simple, really. I'm reinstituting the Homestead Act for families to build what is called an altar of jubilee that were foreclosed upon. This will enable families to stake a claim for property to be theirs. Then by executive order, rent rates will be lowered to affordable median household income levels. Now according to constitutional law asserted by the people, I cannot take away significant amounts of business without equitable compensation. Therefore, I'm announcing interest in entertaining an international Mars contingent for possible mining and colonization. This Mars mission supports disproportionate distribution. Countries with most need of resources per capita will have the greatest claim, adjusted annually. I will provide details after I'm administered the oath for the constitutionally ordered administration and visit the site of the temple in Jerusalem. Now countries like Iran, who desire to show they are ready to play a key role in global economics, will be able to participate in the flight's construction and crew. 
Personally, I value Iran's contribution to discovery and invention. Just as ancient Persia was known for electric clay jars, astrological optic lenses, cell transplantation, and beer making, like they were when they were open and egalitarian, and I would like to see Iran return to its rightful place in modern advancement. Generations past aided the Shah in secret police operations, and presidents, even Reagan, seriously misunderstood Iran's intentions and goals. We changed, and we learned from that. So if Iran wants to set down its weapons buildup and aid to Syria, the United States is prepared to offer full inclusion across a series of steps that prove dedication, reliability, and trust, as we do for Russia. Russia, on the other hand, will not be permitted to participate in the Mars program initially because the United States did not tear down one wall just to see spoiled Tsar Putin raise up another iron curtain to go out conquering and to conquer. Full inclusion is not one direction doorway. To extend equity to all persons as an expression of the desire to remove our own hypocrisy. Considering the way many Amer Native Americans were treated during the expansion phase of American settlements, could have gone much better, and it's time to make it up to them. But as with many things, there were misunderstandings on both sides. Both are aggressors, both are victims. President Andrew Jackson thought he had to protect this nation from retribution, so he felt compelled to cause the forced relocation event we call the Trail of Tears. Today, for each tribe that agrees to our constitutional form of justice, to punish only the guilty rather than to misdirect justice upon an innocent or other form of backlash, then they will be trained and permitted to manage national parks and federally protected lands throughout the United States, with the caveat that there be no burials or any form of witchcraft performed there. This is an attempt to distinguish religious exercise from cultural elements that are benign and reconcile the differences caused by such misunderstandings in exchange for programs that mutually benefit by offering stewardship of land they once had and reducing long-term forestry management costs at the same time. For we've heard the midnight cry, and it's time to ready ourselves and put away foolishness. Additionally, people have demanded there be changes to our political system that have enabled such corruption to take place and requires revisiting. The total sum of all funds raised and any political contributions from corporations and wealthy donors shall be given equal weight to that of contributions by small business and ordinary people in all legislation. Any and all funds raised in political contributions over $285 shall not be anonymous, and no contributor outside a campaign shall be permitted to contribute more than 65 times the federal minimum wage in a given year to a particular campaign or political action committee that supports the same. It's time to make a change. Congressional pay shall be withheld until the federal budget is balanced, barring national disaster. All government agencies, branches, commissions, and committees shall participate in an independent, random term audit and review, including finance, subject to review by the people. We the people can do it. Public servants guilty of defrauding the taxpayer, or acts that result in any gain to a public servant culminating in any expense to the taxpayer, shall pay back with interest at the U.S. Treasury rate retroactively. Any conviction of fraud will result in severe reduction of pay and siphoning a pension to lower middle class salary. Any living expenses stipend for retired elected officials shall expire upon attaining other income greater or equal to that of 3.7 times the poverty level. In closing, this reform will aid in severing the blur between laws that prevent versus laws that punish. While well, removing grievances of the people and bringing balance, as this economic plan includes laws of the people that are equitable. Equity is the closest the law can come to fairness. These acts of equity will be most capable in restoring the Bill of Rights, creating a doctrine of peace, bringing diversity to military command, distributing wealth, sustaining population growth, making health more affordable, and protecting our food and water supply. In consideration, those who oppose this manner of reform will do well to remember all who act against the people for power and prestige have come to ruin, as numerous historical examples persist. However, there is a blessing of prosperity that comes on a nation, where keys unlock discoveries that have not been seen for centuries and millennia, when the leaders of that nation prospers its humblest citizens. The rights of a nation's most privileged cannot exceed the rights of that nation's most humble. Yes, we are abandoning certain traditions that no longer hold any value or impact. 
The square deal is no longer new and has become a raw deal. The people were led to believe greatness would come from hard work and sacrifice, but the people were lied to and stolen from. We the people has become we the corporate execs and Congress. But there is gold that has come out of the fire and has been purified. The tide has turned in the people's favor. America, we must dare to be great. America the great again. For when the government stands with the people, what is perpetuated is liberty. Together we can and we will make a change, not only here at home, but to be that difference in the lives of men, women, and children throughout the world, to be a shining light of example, that city on a hill. Every young person of high-minded purpose wants to be president for the prestige of it. I will give them a reason to aspire, the honor, the dignity, and integrity of the office. If they arise to that high ideal, whether they arrive at such political ambition, their place in the higher echelons of society will have achieved more change than I could ever hope for. This we will do, in keeping with former presidents, our forefathers, and a modern rendition of a 10th century proem, originally entitled Arms Pryden, with the Yorkers played by bankers, Horse and Stallion, the Koch brothers, myself as King David, and Esther, my chosen successor, as hero Sign and Garland. Ours is a tale of suffering by overtaxation, won by turning the tables. So as you can see, there's a better way, where the people have freedom to live in peace and work in harmony without threat to health or their goal of prosperity in this life. America, choose this day whom you will serve. Government of corporate misguided strategy for self-serving interest at the expense of everyone else, the people's expense, or covenant as I have for a government of the people, by the people, and for the people of this great nation. The federal government is truly illegitimate and has been shown to act with willful intent for powers it was not delegated against the Constitution unto erasure of the Bill of Rights for the detriment of the people. The Declaration of Independence says we must defy such government. The federal government must be reauthorized of the Constitution by will of the People Constitutional Authority Board and affirm the federal recall before any election may take place. Now they know their game is up. We call them on it. Our nation must be subject to law. It is our duty to protect and defend the rights and freedoms of the people guaranteed in the Constitution by our mutual uncooperation and solidarity. We fought for the power of the people to be reserved and won. We must occupy and protest the false elections that are taking place in November and must first recognize the first federal recall and reinstill the Voting Rights Act taken away illegally until government of the people comes. It's only a matter of time and we're on the winning side. We will take our government back and defend higher law. Let the airways resound with a loud voice. The governments of these United States have become the governments of the people and their defender. Freedom reigns forever. Now let us pray to the only Savior of this people. And for those who don't believe, it's okay. And I say that. But still, it wouldn't hurt to pray if God were dead. Any fears are unwarranted and do not make sense. Unless, of course, there's a war for your soul. But this is what I believe, and it's my speech. Heavenly Father, bless America, our nation. Let the horn of David be lifted high. Stop war and oppression. Save this people. Hear our cry. Come down from your sapphire blue throne that is gazing upon purple mountains' majesty. Sound the call to awaken weary bones up from among the fruited valley. And as we tribute the cloud over the steeple and founding fathers gone before us, inhabit the thanks of a grateful people. We invoke your foreknowing presence among us. Let us live in your freedom. United we stand. America the beautiful, come heal thy land. Thank you. And until next time, this is the word of the people and Stephen L. Rush wishing you many blessings and a good night.